Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is crisis bargaining. This is the last portion of chapter two of my new book, The Rationality of War. You can find that chapter as a free PDF by clicking on the video description, and the description will also take you to links to Amazon and Barnes & Noble to purchase the book. That self-promotion aside, remember that the question that we've been asking repeatedly over the last few videos is, can war be mutually beneficial? We know that the answer is no. We've seen that in the algebraic model, and we've seen it in the geometric model, but as at some point, we're actually going to want to understand why wars happen, and we're going to do that by looking at game theoretical models. But first, we need our baseline game theoretical model, which is what we're taking care of in this video. And so we're only actually going to make one additional assumption to get this game theoretical model, and the assumption is this. So we're going to assume that A controls the entire good at the start and is going to give B a take it or leave it offer. So in the context of the geometric model that we talked about in the last video, where the states were bargaining over a strip of territory, you can imagine this as though A controls all of that land to start, and so A is just going to sort of move back away from its border with B and say, all right, B, we're going to demand to keep all of this, but we're going to give you the rest of this, and you can either accept that and take over that territory, or you can start a war and try to get more territory from us. It's your choice. So if B accepts that offer, then the settlement is implemented, the new border is essentially drawn, and if B rejects, then the states fight a war just as they have before. So the way we can look at this in a game theoretical model is by drawing a diagram that looks like this. So to sort of go through what's what's going on here, A begins the game by making an offer sized X. This is really a demand X. So X is the amount that A is demanding to keep. It can be any amount between 0 and 1, because remember the object is worth 1. That's everything. It's 100% of the good. B sees this demand size that A makes and either accepts or rejects. If B accepts, then A gets to keep all of X, and B gets to keep the remainder of A's demand, which is 1 minus X. And if B rejects, then we have this, this actor here called N, which represents nature, choosing randomly whether A wins the war or B wins the war, because remember, if B rejects and they fight a war, and if A wins, that occurs with probability PA, then A gets the entire good worth 1, but pays its cost of war, CA and B just gets nothing but still has to pay its cost CB. On the other side, if B wins, then that happens with the probability 1 minus PA, then A doesn't get anything but pays its cost, negative CA, and B, meanwhile, gets everything, the entire good, worth 1, but still has to pay its cost CB. So to solve this game, you intuitively might think that we should start at the top and work our way downward. The problem with that is that whatever is optimal for A at the beginning depends upon what's optimal for B, and whatever's optimal for B depends upon what nature does. So instead of working from the top to the bottom, we actually have to work backward. We have to start at the bottom and work our way to the top. In game theory, we actually call this concept backward induction, but it's not worth actually going over what that is in detail. Just you know, take my word for it that this is smart to go from the bottom to the top for the reasons I just gave. And if you're really interested, then you can look up some videos on YouTube about backward induction from me, and I'll go into a little bit more depth about that. But if you're going to take my word for it, then let's get ahead with this game and start at the bottom and work our way up to the top. So we're going to start with the nature's move. Nature, again, remember, isn't strategic. It just chooses randomly between two things happening. So really what we're interested in doing is simplifying this. And instead of having all of these different outcomes, these two outcomes with a lot of different payoffs, with probabilities thrown into them, what we'd like to do is just to simplify those into payoffs. So think about A's war payoff here. A's war payoff, well, there's two things that can happen. With probability PA, A wins, and A earns 1 minus CA. So with probability PA, A earns 1 minus CA. So PA times 1 minus CA. And then we got to add what happens when B wins the war. So with probability 1 minus PA, B wins, and A pays its cost negative CA. So 1 minus PA times negative CA. That's A's war payoff. And we can do some simplification here, and we eventually get to PA minus CA, which is exactly what we've seen before in the other models. So nothing too unexpected there. It's exactly like it was before. We can do the same thing for B's war payoffs. If B loses the war, which happens with probability uh, PA, because A wins with probability PA, then B gets this payoff, negative CB. So that's that part right here. And then you add that to what happens when B wins. So B wins with probability 1 minus PA and gets a value of 1 minus CB. And you do some simplification there, and you get to an overall war payoff of 1 minus PA minus CB for B. Again, this is exactly what we've seen before. Nothing should be too surprising. So we can take this information. We had nature here originally. We can truncate nature's move and just replace those expected utilities that we saw before. And that's what we've done here. 
So now we can move on to B's optimal move. Let's create some space for ourselves and move that down there. So what's B's optimal move? Well, B is willing to accept if its value for acceptance, 1 minus x, is greater than or equal to its value for rejecting, 1 minus PA minus CV. So we've seen this before in the algebraic model. Again, this is nothing new. This is not new. It's just a new way of interpreting it, a new way of looking at it, and imposing a little bit more structure in the situation. Instead of x being any bargain, x is now just this demand that a is giving to b. So 1 minus x is the remainder of that demand. It's what's being offered to b. And as long as what's being offered to b is more than what b can get out of war, then b is satisfied. And so if you do some simplification here, we see that B is satisfied as long as the demand size X, that's A, how much A is demanding, as long as A demands less than or equal to PA plus CB, B is willing to accept. So now let's think about this from A's perspective. If A demands more than PA plus CB, then what happens? Well, B rejects, and A earns PA minus CA. Okay? Now, that's one thing that could happen. The other thing that could happen is that A demands less than or equal to PA plus CB. So what happens if A demands no more than PA plus CB? Well, B is going to accept that, and A earns X. Now, here's a little bit of a tricky part here. A's payoff is increasing in X. Remember that A's demand size is X, so X is the amount that A gets to keep. A obviously wants to keep as much as it possibly can, so A's payoff is therefore increasing in X and wants to make X as large as it possibly can, given the fact that if A makes too much of an offer or too much of a demand, then B is going to reject. And so A's optimal acceptable offer here is PA plus CB, right? Because if A were to demand anything less than that, A could demand just slightly, slightly more and get B to accept that offer. So that's why A's optimal demand is the most that B is willing to let A have without starting a war. So the last thing we have to do here is just compare what's better for A. Option one is to offer X equals PA plus CB and induce B to accept that offer. Or option two is to demand more than PA plus CB and have B reject that offer. So if A makes this acceptable offer, then it gets, or acceptable demand, then it gets its demand value, which is PA plus CB. And if A makes an unacceptable demand, then A ends up with its war payoff here, PA minus CA. And if you do a little bit of comparing here, it should be pretty obvious that making this acceptable offer is better for A than making the unacceptable offer because A just ends up having to pay its war cost rather than stealing what is essentially B's war cost. B gets to keep that value that, uh, that B would spend on war because B is unwilling to actually pay that value if it can just get how much it would get from war through a peaceful, uh, peaceful settlement, which is what A is willing to offer here. So it doesn't make sense for A to demand everything because B will just fight a war. B will see war as being profitable. And so A interprets that and thinks about it and calculates its, its optimal offer based off of that and is actually willing to make this optimal a peaceful offer, offer a settlement offer, um, and A is more satisfied by doing that than fighting a war. And so our outcome here is, is pretty simple. A demands X equals PA plus CB, B accepts, and peace prevails. So that is the conclusion of this crisis bargaining model, but a roadmap for the future here. Remember that all of the models that we've discussed so far, the algebraic model, the geometric model, and the game theoretic model, all we've seen here is peace. Peace is the outcome every single time. But we know that in practice we see wars occurring, we still want to know why, and one reason that this might, uh, we might have this discrepancy here is that we have models that are way too simple. And so our roadmap going forward is to relax some of these really strong assumptions. So some of the strong assumptions that we've made in these models implicitly is that power remains stable through time. No one's getting stronger over the course of you know the year or two or three or four years or however long. Everyone is just remaining equally powerful at all times. Everyone also knows each other's strength. A knows how strong B is, B knows how strong A is, A knows how much B will pay in war costs, and B knows how much A will pay in war costs. That's a very strong assumption. We've also assumed that the object is infinitely divisible, like land is. Well, land is infinitely divisible, but you know, people like, say, Osama bin Laden, they're not infinitely indivisible. If we chop off Osama bin Laden's torso, well, that means whoever wanted Osama bin Laden to still remain alive doesn't really get anything, so you can't really bargain over people. That's a strong assumption. And we've also assumed that there aren't any first strike advantages. I don't get any advantage from surprising you by catching you off guard, telling you, oh yeah, I'm happy with peace, and then suddenly striking a war while you're not prepared.
So those are all very strong assumptions, and now we're going to relax them in the upcoming videos. So when we relax these assumptions, we'll actually see that war is the result, and we'll call these explanations for war rationalist explanations for war. And to preview this, when power does not remain stable through time, and this causes war, we call that preventive war. You probably heard a lot about that in the media lately. When everyone doesn't know each other's strengths, if we relax that assumption, then we get this very complicated uh, terminology called asymmetric information, incentives to misrepresent. We'll talk about that. When the object is not infinitely indivisible, or infinitely divisible, we have a very uncreative term for that. We call it issue indivisibility. That leads to war. And then lastly, when there are first strike advantages and that causes war, we call it preemptive war, which is distinct from preventive war although the media really screws that up frequently. And so in the next few videos, we will be dissecting each of these explanations for war. And I hope you join me then because we'll actually understand why wars happen after we get through those videos. So thank you and take care.